Oral questions. Questions allow the Honourable Opposition House Leader. Yesterday, the Justice Minister said that the case against Vice Admiral Norman was being handled by the Public Prosecution Service of Canada and was totally independent of the government. But there's only one problem with that. The Prime Minister talked about charges being laid in this case back in April of 2017, wow. almost a full year before any charges were laid. Wow. How did the Prime Minister know a year ahead of time that charges would be laid against Mark Norman? Who told the Prime Minister? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as we have noted in this House many times uh, this week and otherwise, uh, this is a matter that is presently before the courts. A proper judicial proceeding is underway. It's in the hands of the Public Prosecution Service on the, on the Crown side. It's in the hands of very competent Defence Counsel on the Defence side. Uh, and it's inappropriate for Members of Parliament to comment on that process or any aspect of that process while the judicial system is still at work. Lab leader of opposition, Al-Sham. Mr. Speaker, we're asking about the cover-up that's going on right now in the Prime Minister's office. The Prime Minister had no problem announcing to the world on multiple occasions that charges would be laid against Vice Admiral Norman even before an investigation was complete. And earlier this week, government officials had no problem talking to reporters on background about the Treasury Board President's dealings with Irving. But answering serious questions that might embarrass the Prime Minister, silence and lame excuses. Mr. Speaker, who are they protecting? What are they hiding? Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, uh, the Honourable Member talks about uh, lame excuses. Well, the excuses would actually be multiple rulings by the Speaker of the House of Commons and the rules that are compiled uh, for the benefit of the House of Commons by the very table officers in front of you. Mr. Speaker, those rules make it very clear that during the course of a criminal proceeding, it is inappropriate to either ask or answer questions in the House of Commons. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, in November 2015, both the Minister of Defence and the President of the Treasury Board were at the International Security Forum, which took place in Halifax. Can one of those ministers tell this House if a meeting took place with Irving in Halifax between November 20th and November 22nd with one or both of those ministers and what was discussed? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. The, uh, the appropriate place to pursue the details of a criminal proceeding is in a court of law. That's what uh, the rules of the House of Commons say. Uh, and I would point out, as the... Uh, as the table officers have written in the House of Commons com compendium of procedure, quote, members are expected to refrain from discussing matters actively before the courts or under judicial consideration in order to guard those involved in a court action or judicial inquiry from any undue influence. I would remind the honourable member she is neither the prosecutor nor the defender. Mr. Speaker, I can assure the Minister that we are here on behalf of Canadians and we will continue to ask questions on behalf of Canadians. In November 2015, the Minister of Defence and the President of the Treasury Board attended a meeting at the Defence Forum in Halifax. Representatives for Irving were present at that conference. Can one of these two ministers tell us in this House and all Canadians if they met representatives from Irving and if they did, what did they discuss? Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the, the people who are charged with the administration of this particular case are on one side the prosecution. That is the Public Prosecution Service of Canada. On the other side, it is competent defence counsel that have been retained by the defendant in the case. Mr. Speaker, none of the members opposite have that role. And the rules of the House of Commons say that you should leave the work of the prosecution to the prosecutor and the work of the defendant to the defence counsel, not on the floor of the House of Commons. Deputy Louis Saint Laurent. The member for Louis Saint Laurent. All Canadians will notice that we were just asking to know if two ministers had met leaders for Irving, and the minister himself made a direct link between, with the Norman case. Is there something to be read between the lines here? How is it that the minister established a direct link with the Norman case? Yes or no? Will the government finally disclose the evidence it has in this matter? Uh, 
you need. The Honorable Minister of Public Safety. <laughs> in, the, in the question just asked, the Honourable Member has exposed his own subterfuge. Uh, and I would refer him to none other than Peter Van Loan, who said, it is deemed improper for a member in posing a question or a member in responding to a question to comment on any matter that is sub judici. So said Peter Van Loan, and on this occasion, he was right. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Rosemont, La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, you know how I know science is right? It works. Planes fly. Vaccines protect us from disease. And if I drop my pencil, it falls on the ground. It's called gravity. We all agree on that. But when it's time to listen to the 6,000 IPCC scientists who tell us that unprecedented changes are absolutely unavoidable, the Prime Minister pretends it's not true. I say again, their report was alarming. Why do the Liberals continue to subsidize the oil industry and to buy pipelines with our money instead of actually fighting climate change? The Honourable Minister for the Environment. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We have a plan to fight climate change and to grow the economy. We're putting a price on pollution because pollution has a cost. Canadians are the ones who are paying it now because of extreme temperatures, hurricanes, extremely hot days in which people die. We have a clean tech sector that includes Quebec, which plays an important role in the world. We have clean tech companies that are Canadian companies. We're going to continue to grow our economy and tackle climate change. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, we agree. Yes, we have to put a price on pollution. Yes, but right now, the Liberals' plan is not working and they're not doing enough. IPCC scientists are desperately trying to make governments around the entire world that they really must do more to fight climate change. But here in Ottawa, the Liberals bought Trans Mountain with our money, and the Conservatives want to resuscitate the Energy East zombie. It's a Liberal Conservative coalition for pipelines. It's like we're in a bad apocalyptic B movie. All we're missing is sharks in the sharks in the tornadoes. Do the Liberals understand that they're not doing what's necessary? They're not being courageous enough, and they're threatening our children's future. The Minister of Environment and Climate Change, Mr. Speaker, we know very well that we need to tackle climate change for our children and for our grandchildren. We have an opportunity to create good jobs. I am very proud that under our government, our greenhouse gas emissions have gone down and jobs are going up. That's what we must do for our children and grandchildren, and we will continue to do so. Priest. The minister's mandate letter states, quote, it is important to acknowledge mistakes when we make them. By now, surely the minister knows that it is wrong to say that there is no systemic discrimination in Canada. Systemic racism took its root in this country the moment white settlers came and began the colonization process. To claim that there's no systemic racism in Canada is a slap in the face of Indigenous peoples. Will the minister do the honourable thing and admit that he was wrong and apologize? The Honourable Minister for Canadian Heritage. Mr. Speaker, Canadians understand that diversity is our strength. And while we have much to celebrate, we know that there are still real challenges for many people in this country. And let me be very clear, Mr. Speaker, throughout history, and even today, there are people in communities who experience systemic racism, oppression, discrimination, preventing them from fully participating in our society. And we know that these experiences are still felt today by many Canadians, and we can, and we must, Mr. Speaker, do better. Well member for Vancouver East. Then why did the minister say that there's no systemic racism in Canada? The new national anti-racism strategies comes directly from the report taking action against systemic racism and religious discrimination, including Islamophobia. At committee, Senator Murray Sinclair stated, quote, systemic racism is the racism that's left over after you get rid of the racists. Once you get rid of the racists within the justice system, you will still have racism perpetrated 
defy the justice system. Senator Sinclair is absolutely correct. Has the minister even read the report? The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Pete, once again, throughout history and even today, there are people and communities who experience systemic racism, oppression, and discrimination that prevent them from fully participating in our society. And this is exactly why, Mr. Speaker, we're conducting meetings across the country. I had the chance to have three. We're going to have many more meetings. Uh, across in every province across the, the country to discuss this, Mr. Speaker, and we're acting on that. Oh, member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, on November 4th, 2015, the Liberal Cabinet was sworn in, and within days, members of that Cabinet were trying to halt the Davy shipbuilding contract. The President of the Treasury Board has told this House that, as Minister, he was only copied on a letter from Irving. Mm. Will the President of the Treasury Board confirm to this House whether he spoke to Irving during the election before he became Minister? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again, the uh, opposition are uh, attempting to pursue dimensions of an outstanding legal proceeding, and as the rules of this House make very clear, uh, not only are ministers prevented from commenting on those proceedings, that prohibition also applies to the opposition and distinguished uh, former members of this House, like uh, former Minister Van Loan, has made it very clear that this line of questioning is inappropriate. The Honourable Member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, CBC has reported that the member for Halifax West had several meetings with ministers with respect to the Irving shipyard. Will the President of the Treasury Board confirm which members of the Atlantic Liberal Caucus spoke to him about the Davy shipbuilding contract. Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again, uh, the Honourable Gentleman is trying to prosecute a legal proceeding on the floor of the House of Commons, uh, and the uh, rules of the House, including the, uh, the work of the distinguished table in front of us, has made it very clear that that line of questioning is inappropriate. With respect to the activities of lobbyists, Mr. Speaker, of course we have a public registry upon which all of that activity is recorded. Mr. Speaker, Vice Admiral Norman has obtained no personal gain. He's always kept in mind the well-being of his colleagues and the Royal Canadian Navy. His career was exemplary, and he wants to retire with all the dignity and honour that he deserves. He deserves a fair trial. The Prime Minister must, therefore, hand over the evidence necessary for his defence. Who or which group might have an interest here. What is the Liberal government hiding? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, once again, the, uh, the rules of this House are very, very clear. Um, uh, let me again quote the, uh, uh, the table officers who have said members are expected to refrain, refrain from discussing matters before the courts or under judicial consideration in order to protect those involved in a court action or judicial inquiry against any undue influence. By pursuing the line of questioning, Mr. Speaker, the uh, opposition is potentially jeopardizing a legitimate legal procedure. We have, in fact, a very mature judicial system in this country, and that system is more than capable of handling this matter. The Honourable Member for Shikutsumi Lafiao. Mr. Speaker, Canadians want to know. The government is staining the career of an officer who was rewarded for meritorious service for reasons that the Liberal government is hiding. For an open and transparent government, well, so much for that, Mr. Speaker. Will the Prime Minister stop dragging an honourable officer through the mud and provide him with the evidence necessary for his defence? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. The Public Prosecution Service of Canada uh, is in charge of the Crown side of this particular matter. Uh, the defence is obviously in the hands of very distinguished defence counsel. We have uh, a, uh, a, an amazingly strong judicial system in this country that is in fact the envy of the world, and Canadians can trust that system properly administered to deliver justice and to make sure that justice is also seen to be done. Member for Barry Innisville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The honourable gentleman has become aptly skilled at being able to hide behind a corkscrew on this issue. The honourable gentleman also knows the convention around this place dictates 
that the government doesn't dictate to Her Majesty's loyal opposition what questions they ask, in spite of the fact that they are uncomfortable. The fact is that the PM is undermining due process that Vice Admiral Norman is entitled to, and so is his defense team. What is the government trying to cover up? Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, the words that I have quoted to the opposition are, in fact, the words of the Honourable Peter Van Loan, who is one of their own, and he says, quote, it is deemed improper for a member in posing a question or a minister in responding to a question to comment on any matter that is sub judici. Those are the words of Mr. Peter Van Loan, and the opposition would be well advised to take the advice of one of their own. Honourable member for Barry Ennisville. Mr. Speaker, Vice Admiral Norman is in the battle of his life, and the person who is fighting him is the Prime Minister. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, I'm not standing here asking for court records or a report from a courtroom. The Prime Minister has been asked to provide evidence in the case involving Vice Admiral Norman, yet he is refusing. There is precedent, because former Prime Minister Paul Martin turned over evidence when requested during the Gomri inquiry. Oh. It's time for the Prime Minister to stop hiding the truth. Who is he protecting, and what is he hiding. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman's question indicates clearly, unequivocally, and beyond all doubt uh, that what he is referring to here is a matter that is in fact sub judici. The rules that are pronounced by the table, the rules as articulated in the House by Mr. Van Loan, are very clear. Whether the opposition wishes to persist in the line of questioning or not, that line of questioning is inappropriate, and ministers are prevented from responding to those questions for fear of prejudicing the matter that is before the courts. Honourable Deputy Drummond. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals claim to be the champions of the environment, but everyone knows that it's just an act. They won't even be able to achieve the low targets set by Stephen Harper to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. They bought Trans Mountain with our money, and they're not even closing the door to the Conservatives when they ask for Energy East to be revived. Will the Liberals commit to listening to Quebecers and to never bringing back Energy East, which is a bad pipeline? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise today to talk about the Canadian economy and the importance of pipelines. At the same time, when it comes to Energy East, this is a business decision that was made at the time. I would like to seize the opportunity to mention to the NTP that the platform we're moving forward when it comes to renewable energy and the investments we're making in green technology, we've invested more than $27 billion. And if you look at the NDP platform for 2015, less than $3 billion. On this side, we believe that we can move forward the environment and the economy together. Edmonton Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, just one day after announcing regulations that they described as a complete and comprehensive ban on asbestos, this government is announcing a stream of exemptions and funding for a project they should have banned. Quebec health authorities have asked the federal government not to exempt mining waste, expressing deep concern over the lack of proper occupational health and safety standards. Instead, this government listened to the asbestos lobby. Why is this government ignoring health and science experts and continuing to put Canadian workers at risk to exposure to asbestos? The Honourable Thank Minister you, Mr. of Environment. Speaker, I was thrilled yesterday to announce that we have a comprehensive ban on asbestos. That's the sale, the manufacture, the import, export, and use of, man of, uh, of asbestos. I stood with Hassan Youssef. He's the head of the Canadian Labour Congress. And you know what he said? He said that this was very good for Canadian workers. Hassan Youssef is actually someone who's exposed to, you, to asbestos. He understands how damaging it can be for health, how it kills people's lives. In very exceptional circumstances, Circumstances. There are exceptions. Those exceptions are time limited. There is reporting requirements, and there is no impact on human health. Member for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this morning we learned that the five major Inuit organizations 
pulled out of the government's working group on food security. It was clear from the start that the Liberals had no intention of listening. The consultations were, quote, just tokenism and optics so they can justify the changes that they want to make. The government's failure has real consequences. Tokenism does not feed children. When will the Liberals get back to the table and take this issue seriously? The Honourable Prime Minister, Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It goes without saying that our government is committed to ensuring that Northerners have access to affordable food all throughout the North. We want to work meaningfully with all parties, including Inuit, First Nations, Métis and Northerners, on food security. Mr. Speaker, Inuit organizations... I think the, the interpretation is not working. Is it, not, is it working now, en français? Is it interpretation? Ça marche maintenant? Okay. All right. We're going to pick it up halfway through and we'll finish the rest of the response. The Honourable uh, Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Inuit organizations have an important and unique perspective to offer to Nutrition North Canada. That's why we've engaged with them. We have valued their expertise. We valued their knowledge in this process. Their engagement has really been vital for us in developing our new initiative and providing thoughtful solutions on how we move forward with food security for Northerners. We're going to continue to work with Inuit right across the North as we will with all all Indigenous groups and all Northerners to ensure that the revisions to Nutrition North are what people are The Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it was three years ago. This was a key election promise by this government. We know that the food cost in the North is absolutely staggering, but after going through the process, one of the um, and withdrawing from the consultations, an Inuit leader told CBC that she had lost all hope. She was told by a government employee, and listen to this, she was told by this employee, if you guys don't want to be at the table, it's just going to move forward anyways. This is a government that said no relationship is more important than Indigenous peoples in Canada. Is this how they treat this most important relationship? And when is the government stop going to be so disrespectful and move forward in terms of this important initiative? Well, the Honourable Parliament Secretary, the Minister of Northern Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This has been a priority for us, and we want to make sure that we're going to get it right. This is why we've been engaging with Northerners, with Inuit, with Métis, with First Nations on how we move forward with this project. Mr. Speaker, the Minister himself visited all three territories in the last few weeks. He met with premiers and leaders of government and organizations about this extremely important initiative and the changes that we're about to implement. We understand how important nutrition is to people in the North, and we know how important it is that the Government of Canada get it right so that it helps Northerners feed their The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Similkami Nicola. Mr. Speaker, two years ago the CRTC announced that a 50 megabyte download speed internet is a basic service that all Canadians should have access to. Now the Government claimed they would make that a reality. However, now the details are out, and we can see the Liberals have failed again. They've slashed their target in half, Mr. Speaker. No. Why does the Minister think Canadians do not deserve the internet service that he gets in his own office? Well, Parliament Secretary, the Minister of Innovation and Science. Mr. Speaker, we, as a government, we have understood the importance of broadband across Canada. That's the reason why which we, are, we have invested in through Connect to Innovate over $500 million across Canada, a variety of different projects in every region of the country, Mr. Speaker, in order to increase uh, the access that Canadians have to good quality, high-speed internet access. We're going to continue moving forward in that direction, Mr. Speaker. We'll take no lessons from the previous government on, on internet connectivity. Member for Central Okanagan, Smilkami Nicola. Once again, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals talk big and then fail to deliver. Yes. Now, on giving Communist That's China controlled right. Huawei access to our mobile network, the Public Safety Minister has said, Ooh. We'll check their equipment, don't worry. But the reality is that equipment will often break down, need to be quickly replaced, and may not be perfectly inspected and documented. When will the Liberals see that this big talk about checking every piece of technology is not practical, and like our allies in Australia and the United States, simply ban Huawei from accessing our 5G network, Mr. Yeah, yeah. Speaker? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Innovation and Science. 
Mr. Speaker, as we've stated a number of times in this House, our government, yes, is open to foreign investment in Canada because it benefits Canadians, but we will never, ever compromise, Mr. Speaker, our national security. As a government, Unlike the previous government, Mr. Speaker, we're investing in 5G, we're investing in it seriously because we appreciate that that's what, what Canadian consumers want and need to participate in the future economy, and we will rely on the opinions of our public security experts, Mr. Speaker, we'll rely on our experts when we look at who gets to participate in those 5G networks. The Honourable Member for Centia saint -Bagot. Mr. Speaker, last March, the Minister of Health told Anna Gervais, with her hand on her heart, that the government is going to take action on high alcohol, high sugar drinks, which, you will recall, caused the death of Athena Gervais. But the response from the minister was op the opposite. They're going to continue to consult. But the 15 recommendations from the committee were clear. The government must take action now to protect our children. When will the government finally translate its words into action and protect our children. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health. Health and safety of Canadians is a top priority for our government and we continue to work to identify actions that can be taken to address the harms associated with problematic alcohol use. Following the tragic death of Athena Gervais, we immediately took action to begin work to restrict the amount of alcohol in highly sweetened alcohol beverages. We thank the Health Committee for their work uh, we've tabled a response to their recommendations and we'll be introducing regulations in the near future to ensure tragedies such as this never occur again. Well, member for Kootenay, Columbia. Mr. Speaker, Anita lives in a small town in my riding of Kootenay, Columbia. She was recently ordered to attend a meeting at the Regional Immigration Office in Vancouver, a 1,700 kilometer round trip. Taking a week off work for travel was impossible for her, so she asked if she could go to a closer IRCC office in Calgary. They said, no, meetings must take place in the province of residence. This is a big country with big provinces, and sometimes it makes sense to use a regional office that's closer. Canadians understand that. Why doesn't the Department of Immigration? Honourable Parliament Secretary, the Minister of Immigration and Refugees. Mr. Speaker, our government understands full well that our economic success as a country is dependent on welcoming newcomers into our communities and providing them avenues to contribute to their local economies. We know equally as well that the diversity of newcomers adds to the richness of Canada. We are reinvesting in economic immigration streams and in welcoming refugees. I remind the member opposite that th under this government we saw a historic effort to resettle 56,000 Syrian refugees in this country. We are equally reinvesting in our department and our officials so that they can provide the type of immigration services that newcomers to our country uh, expect and that Canadians expect as well. The Honourable Member for Lac-Saint-Louis. In my riding of Lac-Saint-Louis, many constituents have shared with me through emails, phone calls, visits to my office, discussions in the community, their concerns about the need to address uh, the serious and unfortunate problem of animal cruelty, including with respect to uh, gaps in the criminal code as regards bestiality and animal fighting. Could the Minister of Justice please update this House on what our government is doing to address animal cruelty? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank uh, the Honourable Member from Lac St. Louis for his question, his advocacy, in fact, all parliamentarians' advocacy on this important issue. Yesterday, I was proud to introduce Bill C-84, which delivers on our government's commitment to protect children and animals from abuse. We are toughening the laws against bestiality and animal fighting, conduct that is completely unacceptable. I look forward to the support of all members in this House. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, the Indian Resource Council represents hundreds of First Nations and advocates for First Nations oil and gas producers. Their president and CEO, Stephen Buffalo, says, quote, Bill C-69 will harm Indigenous economic development, create barriers to decision-making, and make Canada unattractive for resource investment. This legislation must be stopped. Premiers, economists, and the private sector all say the same. When will the Prime Minister kill his No More Pipelines Bill C-69? The Honourable Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. I'm very pleased to stand up and talk about how we're going to rebuild the trust of Canadians and how we approve major projects. 
I have worked very hard with Indigenous peoples. In fact, we had a working group that included representatives from Indigenous organizations throughout the whole process. It's interesting because the party opposite, they actually jammed through legislation that, that killed trust by Canadians in how we did environmental assessments. We know we can do better. We know that we can protect the environment, we can grow the economy, and this is part of our strategy to do exactly that. The Honourable Minister, Member for Lakeland. Well, the minister should actually listen to what First Nations are saying instead of countering with the exact opposite. The majority of First Nations do support responsible resource development for the benefit of all Canadians, and it's key to poverty reduction and to Canada's high standard of living. The reality is investment, though, is fleeing Canada under these Liberals. And here's what Stephen Buffalo also says, quote, Indigenous communities are on the verge of a major economic breakthrough, one that finally allows Indigenous people to share in Canada's economic prosperity. Bill C-69 will stop Stop this progress in its tracks. So when will the Liberals kill their No More Pipelines Bill C-69? It's always uh, heartening to hear that the party opposite cares about Indigenous peoples and Indigenous rights after they did nothing for a decade. We are pleased that we have been working with Indigenous peoples. Let me explain to the party opposite how we're working with Indigenous peoples. There will be early engagement with Indigenous peoples, that we will actually be sitting down with Indigenous peoples, not dumping big documents about projects on their desks. We're going to have a consultation plan so that we can listen to them and we can figure out how we work forward to, we move forward together. I agree, there are huge economic opportunities for Indigenous peoples. We need to make sure they benefit. They didn't under the previous... The Honourable Member for Sturgeon River, Parkland. Well, the fact is, Mr. Speaker, these Liberals are failing Indigenous communities. The Liberals' No, Pipe, no More Pipelines Bill, also known as C-69, is a threat to the prosperity of all Canadians. A Texas company was recently awarded because it was able to get a pipeline permitted and built in only eight months. But under these Liberals, we're not even sure if we're ever going to get a pipeline built ever. When will this government get serious about pipeline jobs and scrap this terrible legislation? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know what? After 10 years of inaction by the Harpers, the, the Harper government, 99% of our oil was actually distributed to the U.S. And in 2015, same thing occurred. Their approach failed, and they're doubling down on that failed approach, disregarding the courts. No plan to protect the environment and coastal communities with no plan for meaningful two-way dialogue with Indigenous communities. We will take no lessons from the previous government. Let's see. Honourable Member for Calgary, Signal Hill. Well, Mr. Speaker, I know that the government isn't listening to the Indigenous community, so we'll see if they listen to the business community. Mr. Speaker, recently I had the opportunity to visit the Port of Vancouver. And at the Port of Vancouver, there's hundreds of millions of dollars worth of construction in new facilities happening today. And the officials at the Port of Vancouver said to me, if Bill C-69 would have been in place two years ago, not one dollar of what's being spent today would be invested in the Port of Vancouver. So will this minister stand up today and say to the, f the business community who are investing in the Port of Vancouver, she will kill this bill. The Honourable Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. I'll stand up today and explain why we need Bill C-69, why we need to rebuild trust in environmental assessments, because guess what? If you don't have trust in how you approve major projects, no projects go ahead. We have an obligation to Canadians to figure out how we're going to both protect the environment and grow the economy. I have spent, with my colleagues, meetings with across over two years listening to the business community. We have shorter timelines under Bill C-69. We are providing more certainty of the Process. We are also working with Indigenous peoples. We are also working with provinces. We need to get this right because that way we will have investment dollars flowing. The Honourable Member for London, Fanshawe. Mr. Speaker, the Canadian Union of Postal Workers gave a strike notice to Canada Post this week. After falling behind because of a Harper-mandated agreement, postal workers have been negotiating for almost a year to improve working conditions and improve services for Canadians. Mr. Speaker, Canadian workers deserve better. Will this Liberal government continue the Harper ways that undermine workers' fundamental rights, or will it ensure that Canada Post management negotiates in good faith for sustainable community-based jobs that best serve Canadians? Honourable Minister of Labour. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, we've said all along, this is a government that firmly believes in the value of collective bargaining. In fact, we believe that an agreement that is arrived upon by both parties through collective bargaining is a strong agreement and one that can bring a company and its, uh, and its workers forward into, into the next term. And so we stand by both parties. Federal mediation is working with both parties, and we look forward to the resolution of, uh, of their collective agreement. Thanks. The Honourable Member for Hochelaga. Mr. Speaker, the changes made to, to the Parliamentary Protective Service are simply not working. Employees in the Parliamentary Protective Service for the House of Commons have been without a contract since 2016, and nothing has changed in two years. PPS managers must now start to negotiations within the next 20 days. In addition, it seems that the employer has threatened employees who are exercising their rights protected by the Charter. Will the government amend the Act, uh, the Par Act of Parliament? the Act of Parliament to protect the rights of the, and the independence of the Parliamentary Protective Service? Mr. Speaker, um, the legislation in many ways may need to be amended, but I would note that the matter referred to by the Honourable Member is under the jurisdiction of the House and not under the jurisdiction of the Government. The Honourable Member for Charlotte Old saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, June 1263, July 1634, August 1747, September 1601. Mr. Speaker, that's the number of illegal migrants who've entered Canada over the past four months alone, the vast majority entering through Quebec. Canadians want to know why the government isn't doing anything. We're being insulted and being tell, t told we're non-Canadian. Now, four months later, I have a question. Do you have a plan to resolve this problem? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for his question. I want to assure him that the government does, in fact, have a plan, and that we've, we've been working very diligently with, with our international partners to address the issues that lead to, to that migration. Uh, the RCMP, the CBSA, RIRCC, and the IRB have all been working diligently in order to create greater efficiencies and to ensure that for every individual, regardless of how they come into this country, Mr. Speaker, I want to assure the member opposite and all Canadians that the security of this country is maintained through the diligent work of our public officials. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Edmonton Manning. Mr. Speaker, that's the plan of no plan. Mr. Speaker, it's clear that the Prime Minister has no plan to ensure the integrity of our border. The number of illegal crossings are, is on the rise. We've already had more this year than the, the same time last year. Canada's Conservatives have proposed a plan. So far, the Liberals have totally failed to resolve this problem. While Canadians are struggling to make ends meet, what is the total projected cost for processing, transporting, housing, and social welfare programs for these people. The Honourable Minister of Border Security. Again, Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to, to advise the member opposite that we've seen some tr tremendous success in reducing the number of people that have been presenting themselves at our border. And since April of this year, Mr. Speaker, we've seen significant reductions. And in fact, the number of people who crossed this summer irregularly was 70 percent less than, than what we experienced just last year. And so we're making real progress, Mr. Speaker. We can assure Canadians as well that the issue of how these issues, these individuals are treated, by Canadian law, we have to treat them and to allow them to process and to provide support to the provinces and municipalities to ensure they're properly treated. That work is ongoing between ourselves, the province of Quebec, the province of Ontario, cities of Montreal and Toronto. Mr. Speaker, this is a well met The Honourable Member for Calgary, Shepherd. Mr. Speaker, Dominique Degg is one of thousands of Canadians affected by the Liberal Phoenix fiasco. She hasn't been paid in 15 months. I sent a letter to the Public Works Minister in July of this year on behalf of Dominique, and guess what? No answer. The, the, the Minister said operations can be November of 2017, that hardship cases will be dealt with in just a couple of weeks. She's lost her home and moved back in with her dad. Will the Public Works Minister take responsibility and the empty talking points and pay Dominique the wages she's earned. Honourable Parliament Secretary to the Minister of Public Services. Mr. Speaker, and of course we are determined to stabilize and um, ensure that our public servants, our hardworking public servants, are paid on time and are paid accurately, and that would include uh, the employee to which uh, my honourable colleague refers. We will look into the specific case, but I would just point out to my honourable colleague that perhaps he should survey the front bench 
of his, of his own uh, parliamentary group here to find a, an apology, which we are still waiting for, to the public servants of Canada to have left us with this fiasco of the pay system that they left us with after eight years of planning. Question period. Honourable Member for Ottawa Venue. Mr. Speaker, I'm glad it's my turn. I was proud to see that our government was continuing its commitment to diversity by supporting or organizations through increased multicultural funding in Budget 218. As part of the funding, the government announced that it would engage communities on the development of a new anti racism approach that brings communities and interfaith leaders together to find new ways to combat discrimination. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister of Canadian Heritage and Multiculturalism update this House on how the development of a new anti-racism strategy is developing? Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague for an important question, which allows me to, to repeat something that I said many times again, something extremely important for me, Mr. Speaker, that throughout history, and even today, there are people in communities who experience systemic racism, oppression and discrimination, preventing them from fully participating in our society. We know that these experiences are still felt by many Canadians, and we can and we must do better, Mr. Speaker. That's why we're conducting those important sessions, Mr. Speaker. And toute forme de racisme et discrimination est totalement... And any type of discrimination is completely unacceptable, and it must be fought on a daily basis. That is why we are holding those consultations today. We will continue to fight against racism and discrimination. The Honourable Member for Megantic Clérable. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals are a lost cause. They literally misled uh, producers under supply management. They pretended to defend them, and they continue to improvise at the expense of producers. Now, they've reached an agreement with the U.S. that will invade our market with milk, prevent us from exporting throughout the world. Less quota, no exports, no compensation. Is that a good agreement? Is that what the Liberals think is a good agreement? Why have they once again failed to defend our producers? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, we have defended our supply management system from the aggressive attempts by the U.S. to dismantle it. Access to the market is similar to the changes negotiated by the Conservatives under the PTT. We are the party that put in place the supply management system, and we are the government that has defended it. And that is exactly what we did. We understand that there will be repercussions for our farmers, and we committed to compensating them fairly and fully to support them in their success. The Honourable Member for Avignon, Matan, Lamitis, Metapedia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Wednesday, October 17th, was the International Day for the Elimination of Poverty. And thanks to programs like the Canada Child Benefit, the National Strategy, Housing Strategy, among other things, our government since 2015 has lifted some 650,000 people out of poverty. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Family, Children and Social Development tell the House how our government continues to help Canadians who are working uh, who are work, hard-working Canadians, uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for Avignon, Amitis Matin, Matapédia, for his advocacy uh, in favour of Canadians living in poverty. Since we took government in 2015, our government has invested $20 billion to help Canada's most vulnerable people. Thanks to the National Strategy for Poverty Reduction, re reduction rather, we are reaching the lowest levels of poverty in the history of Canada, and our government is committed to today and in the future to be a leader and a full-fledged partner in fighting poverty. Thank you. Honourable Member for Bow River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Two years ago in the city of Brooks, Tanya Campbell Lozier was killed by her boyfriend in a domestic dispute. She was just 19 years old. On September 27th, her killer was released on day parole after serving just four months. 
This is yet another example of our justice system acting like a revolving door under this government. Catch and release. In the words of Tanya's mother, Tanya got no justice. Do the liberals agree with Tanya's mother that a four-month sentence for killing someone sure. is not justice? Sure. Sure. The Honorable Minister of Public Safety. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I would uh, uh, undertake to look into the circumstances of this particular case. Uh, I believe it may fall under provincial jurisdiction, but I'll examine that. Uh, the uh, rules with respect to uh, uh, to day parole uh, that apply at the present time, Mr. Speaker, were in fact uh, implemented through a legal framework under a private member's bill that was proposed by a member of the Conservative Party. La la député de Repentigny. The Honourable Member for Repentigny. Mr. Speaker, you undoubtedly know that bees play an essential role in our biodiversity, but to pesticides, more specifically neonicotinoids, are leading, going to make them extinct. They're not good for the environment, nor are they good for human health. Europe will be banning these products by the end of the year. But here, the government is simply hiding behind consultations that won't lead to any concrete results until when, Mr. Speaker? 2025. This week, Equiter called on the government to follow suit and imitate Europe. Will the government immediately put in place measures to help agricultural producers eliminate neonicotinoids by the end of this year? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, Health Canada is working with the United States Environmental Protection Agency and scientists from around the world to ensure that there are no long-term impacts from neonics on bees. In addition, Health Canada is currently conducting a scientific review that includes risks to wild bees such as bumblebees. New scientific information will be taken into consideration prior to making any final decisions. Health Canada will continue to monitor the situation and take action as necessary. The Honourable Member for Manicouagan. Mr. Speaker, a year ago I tabled Bill C-372 to protect workers' pension funds. A year ago, Sears closed. For the past three years, retired people from Cliffs, back home on the North Shore, have been fighting to reclaim their uh, pension and insurance, which was stolen from them. Retired people should be, pro be the priority when a company goes under. For decades, nothing's been done. The Liberals have done nothing, and they're just thinking about consulting. It's high time we protected our workers uh, and our retired people from the shameful theft by multinationals. Do the Liberals intend to protect retired people by supporting my bill? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Innovation. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je remercie le... Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Honourable Member opposite for her question. We understand, Mr. Speaker, the difficulties faced by employees and retirees when a company uh, restructures or goes bankrupt. Uh, that's why under our most recent budget, we committed, Mr. Speaker, to putting in place a balanced government-wide program to strengthen retirement. We are currently, Mr. Speaker, consulting parties uh, across the country to come up with a fair solution for retired retirees in our country. Uh, this will uh, conclude question period for today. Tabling of documents. Depot de documents. L'enlève ministre. The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Today, uh, on behalf of the President of the Treasury Board, in both official languages, the Public Accounts of Canada 2018, the Verificator General du Canada a mis une... The Auditor General uh, submits his audit on Canada's finances. Our government has...